We, uh, on the second day of the digital accessibility bootcamp for designers, developers, policymakers, educators, and persons with disabilities. And today we're going to talk about why web accessibility matters. And the quote behind it is that it's a fundamental human right. So before I begin, we just have to give some acknowledgments to the Secretary General of the CTU, Ms. Bennett Lewis. Um, she has been very grateful to gracious us in terms of giving us some support. And uh, so I just need to make sure that I mention her. And of course, Dr. Beverly Beckles, who has given her clearance to come to the NCPD to do the field trip. And of course, she has constantly been giving us support in other ways. And of course, I just need to mention my team briefly. Um, so it's eight of us and just want to thank everyone for really contributing overall to the growth and development of the company. So in terms of the bootcamp schedule, uh, so far we've covered uh, Saturday, which is the, the introductory session. And today we're going to talk about why web accessibility matters. We will have six more sessions after this. Um, just to recap the learning objectives, this bootcamp is really geared towards creating an environment where all the major players in the ecosystem would be able to come together to co-create projects that uh, solve accessibility problems in the workplace. And to recap, what we're going to do today is to go to cover why web accessibility matters, uh, some of the different types of disabilities and related challenges, and uh, a little bit about the assistive technologies that uh, persons with disability use to access the web. So my guest speaker today is Alan Hoffman. He's an accessibility tester DQ. And the DQ's philosophy is that uh, digital equality is our mission, our vision, and our passion. And uh, I'm really glad that Alan has chosen to join us. I met Alan. Uh, roughly around in June month at the M Enabling Summit. And you know, I met him and his team, Mandy and, and Josh and they, and they're really, really nice and they shared a lot of information with me. So I'm really glad that uh, Alan has chosen to come online and share his knowledge with us. So without a further ado, I'm going to uh, yeah? Alan yeah. to, uh, can you um, mute your mic please? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, and if you, if you could mute, you mute your microphone, it would help um, everyone here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so thanks, thanks, Sean. And if, if you could, can you go down to slide 14, Sean? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Alan, so I, I muted everyone's mic. Uh, okay. So, all right. So, let's go proceed. So, without further ado, I will introduce Alan. Alan, you can tell them a little bit more about yourself. So, um, hello folks, hope you can hear me. Uh, and I'm Alan Hoffman, I'm with DQ Systems. Um, I'm actually a, a principal accessibility strategist with DQ Systems. Um, and a little about myself is, uh, well, I'm 55. Um, if folks can mute their microphones, that would be good. Um, I'm married with three children. Um, I have been a programmer, an internet business owner, and a United States federal government employee for almost 30 years. And now I'm back in the commercial world with DQ Systems. Um, I'm blind. Um, I use a screen reader. I use Braille. <clears throat> I use a cane to get around. Um, that's, I think that's the really high level. Um, hold on just one second, and I will jump to my next slide. Um, so if we're on slide 14, Sean, it's a, you know, what is digital accessibility? And it's a pretty simple thing. It's creating digital content which is usable by people with disabilities who usually use assistive technology. I'm 
paraphrasing the slide, but that's generally what it means. But that digital content can be web pages, it can be web applications, it could be mobile apps, it could be electronic documents. So Google Docs, Microsoft Office, these slides you're seeing now, um, all of that is digital content that you can make accessible for people with disabilities who may or may not be using assistive technologies. Um, let's go to the next slide, Sean. So why is that, why does this matter or why is it important? Um, as Sean said, it's a fundamental human right. Um, access to information is a key thing for education, employment, um, entertainment, and almost aspects of life, even just simple things like uh, shopping, uh, paying your bills, um, getting a doctor's appointment. Access to information is, is becoming pretty much indispensable. And because of that, it's, it's basic to people's uh, fundamental well-being, including people with disabilities. Um, and I've, I've got a couple other comments that I, I put in for this slide, Sean. So uh, the United Nations Civil Rights for People with this, Persons with Disabilities is a, is a UN treaty, which is signed by pretty much all the member states, almost all anyway. Um, and it sets out a, a, a fairly important set of human rights related to people with disabilities. And, and part of that is access to information, employment, and education, and things like that. <clears throat> and as it says on the slide here, it's just the right thing to do. You know, why would you not provide accessibility to, in worldwide, it's a billion people that have one form of a disability or another. And so providing content and information which is inaccessible, you're cutting out something on the order of 20% of the people who need to work and use your information. Um, and that, that's a pretty significant set of your total population. And if you wanna take this just to a selfish level, um, almost all of us are gonna have a disability at some point in our life whether it's temporary or permanent, as we age, uh, we all find one form of disability or another, um, just kind of how it is. Slide 16, how let's, people let's, with disabilities use the web. So let's, let's go to slide 16. So how do people with disabilities use the web? And I'm, again, I'm gonna be paraphrasing some of this so I don't have to read and talk at the same time. So I'm blind. Um, and I use um, software which runs on my laptop, which read green. Um, I can sort of tell it what I need it to read. As I move around the screen, it reads the screen so it can read these slides, for example, to read the title and then the, the bullets. Um, and at the same time, I'm using my mobile phone to use the Zoom app uh, to you know, be able to mute and unmute my mic, or leave and enter this meeting, or even join the meeting. Um, and so, I, right now, I'm using two different technologies: one to use the web, the other to use an app. Um, and people that have limited vision, they have applications that will make the screen larger, let them change the the colors that are on the screen, because some people have difficulty seeing some colors. Um, who can't type with their hands or, or use a mouse, uh, they can use speech input. Uh, there's a well-known program called Dragon Dictate. Um, Windows 10 has speech input built into it, so does Microsoft Office. Uh, you know, iPhones and Android phones have speech input in, in the most places in them these days and um, that's just one example of how somebody who can't use use their hands to type or run the computer can, can operate the computer. Um, then you have people who have no hearing or limited hearing um, 
when they're watching media on the on the computer and it needs questions so that they can understand the words that are being spoken or if there's audio prompts on the computer or the mobile phone then there are vi visual alternatives for them um, so uh, people who are deaf or have limited hearing also uh, they some things on the, uh, the new technology they they really love like they, they love like on their iphone they love facetime or like zoom they can do sign language back and forth on the phone which for sign language users is way faster than texting um I'm trying to think who i left out uh people with cognitive disabilities so that could be people who have trouble remembering things have trouble processing text so dyslexia um, some people have trouble processing numbers um, some people have attention deficit issues and so there's a lot of add to the internet or the web or content which can just make the information almost unusable for them um, so for example if you have a web page that has a lot of moving and or blinking content on it uh, some people just simply cannot process all that at once um, and if you have the wrong kind of flashing or blinking content you can actually cause some people to have a seizure which could actually be very damaging to them and so there are things we can do to maximize how many people can use the information and the content we put on the web um, we won't be going through all those today this is just kind of an introduction um, but because of those reasons that's why you know making the information accessible is so critical there, there, the reality is there's so many things we can do that make information unusable for a significant portion of our audience that it's really important to learn how to think about those people think about it as a people first sort of approach when you're making information and content to go out on the internet or even if it's not on the internet if it's just a standalone application um so let's go to slide 17. So I think I sort of already hit on 17 categories of disabilities. Let's see if I missed any. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to just jump in and ask. I have no problem with that. Um, I already touched on slide 18 with types of assistive technology. Slide 19. Um, so I want to come up on um, slide 20, Sean so many terms and so many perspectives so there's a lot of buzzwords around digital accessibility which digital accessibility is one of them so i want to go through a few of those so that if you hear them in the in the near term um it'll, some of them will make a little more sense as opposed to just sound like um, extra words um, so the first one is just a simple one accessibility and accessibility really amounts to that somebody can use your information so they can perceive it, operate it, and understand it. Um, doesn't say that it's easy to use, doesn't it? Doesn't say it's easy to operate. Um, it, they can. It's sort of the, the baseline. And along with accessibility goes the word compliance. There are um, a set of accessibility standards and guidelines out there in the world with the um, the most major one being the World Wide Web Consortium uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, those guidelines, if you meet them, you're going to be pretty accessible. Um, however, you can meet those guidelines and still have products which are not really very usable. Um, you can make things that are you can you can understand the material on the screen but it takes for a you know you might take a long time or it may be very inconvenient to use uh, for numerous reasons 
So accessibility and compliance are sort of the, the lowest common denominator. Um, there's a lot of emphasis of late in pushing to be way past that um, to inclusive design and inclusion, uh, which I'm coming to next, as well as diversity uh, and user experience. Um, but I will say that the accessibility guidelines that are in the world today do an awful lot if people follow them. Uh, so I'm not quite, I don't discount them as much as some folks in the, in the business do. Um, you know, getting, getting something that's pretty darn good and get a lot of that hap done is maybe better than only having one thing that's really great and 12 that are very bad. Um, so I'll go on to uh, inclusion. Inclusion really relates to people first. Um, and, you know, for example, if you're a business that you hire people with disabilities or hire people with a whole range of abilities and disabilities, um, and then when you do hire them, make sure that you provide them opportunities to advance, make sure you provide them the, the tools they need to do their jobs. Uh, if there's training that you provide, make sure that's accessible so they can, you know, learn the material. Um, and designing, if you have uh, information or products, and then design them with people with disabilities in mind and, you know, maybe bring them in to have them, uh, you know, pilot your product, take their information into account up front. Uh, the phrase out there in the disability community is nothing about us without us. Um, so that's that's sort of the the topic of inclusion and inclusive design is bring people with disabilities in in through that whole design and development process and get their feedback as you go along and you know you'll probably have a lot less problems at the end of the road. And then you get to diversity, and uh, diversity is a lot like inclusion. It really focuses on a lot of the who do you who do you have in your user base? Who do you have in your uh, employees? Who do you have support in your educational activities? Um, and really, it comes down to try to get a, a good wide the widest amount of types of people people with different abilities disabilities. Um, people with different ethnic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, countries of origin, you know, bring them all into the, to, to your organization and, and treat them well. And uh, it will improve your overall product and your prop margin if you're in the commercial space. Um, so it's a little different than accessibility compliance or inclusive design. Uh, and it's a little more wide scoped. Um, and then the last term that, that I would throw out on this is um, it's UX. Everybody talks about UX, and that's really the user experience. Um, and a lot of this is a lot of folks in design. So you have design, development, testing, uh, maintenance of of information and products, and the user experience. When you pair that with inclusive design and accessibility. Uh, the the CEO of Microsoft would he likes to talk about creating delightful user experiences. So if you're using one of their products, you should actually enjoy you. And the same holds true for creating products for people with disabilities. Um, so that's kind of where the UX comes from. Um, let me see what. Hi, hi, Alan. Yes, sir. Could you explain again diversity, diversification? So it's really diversity. Diversity, yeah. Um, so diversity, I would say historically diversity has come in the U.S. from making sure that we address um, disparities in racial, in you know, employment, housing and education, but, you know, it's not limited to that. It's, you know, inclusion of people with disabilities, but it really 
it's it takes on a little wider scope than inclusive design. Um, so you can make your product accessible, but you know if you don't reach out to people with disabilities and include them in the process, then it still might have problems. And you should make sure that you have a as the the widest set of people involved in your uh, develop design development. Uh, sales, maintenance, use of your products uh, and your customers as you can, and um, it'll work better for everyone. So it's, Does that help? It's kind of like a hands-on approach. Yes, oh, it okay. is. Um, um, let's see what number slide. Slide 23. What is trusted tester? Two. Slide. Um, slide 22. What is trusted tester? So this is sort of a big jump. Um, these these sort of got put in here from a previous talk I gave, but I think um, they don't hurt. Can and I'm not sure how to measure this. Do we have any developers in the audience, testers? And if you're on mute, feel free to unmute. Then you mean software? Uh, either web or software, or uh, frankly, or anything else. Hi, you all able to hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I'm Manalo James. I'm from North 11. Um, I'm not doing development right now, but my training is in product design. So we have health solutions, um, but not okay. in web, in, um, in actual, like, like, yeah, physical products. Okay. Um, um, well, then I'll go through this part a little more quickly. Um, so, I know. Oh. go go ahead. Um, do testing of I like to test these up on a websites for accessibility as well. Yeah, I am. Okay. I am impaired. Okay, so uh -huh. one of the challenges in accessibility. Um, and for right now, we'll just limit it to the web, is that if you ask three accessibility testers who were experienced accessibility testers, you ask them the question, hey, does my website meet the accessibility standards? And you would probably get three different answers, guaranteed. Um, and if you're the website developer, the guy building the website, then like, you know, what do you do? You're like, well, who do I believe? Or do I just listen to all of them, do it all? Um, and in some cases, they would even have difference of opinion of no, that meet does meet or that doesn't meet. So, you know, then you kind of come down to flip a coin. And if you're trying to make those decisions in a reasonable period of time, then it's a lot of time that you waste just figuring out what your testers told you. And um, in my previous life um, as a federal employee, um, we had 14 agencies who were dealing with that that challenge. And we said, well, okay, that's enough of this. We've got to we've got to teach people how how we want to do accessibility tests so that we can get some consistency. So that if you one tester tests a web page and to gives you accessibility feedback, and another tester, you should get similar answers. Um, it's the same web page after all. And so we developed a test process, which looks at the web page code, but it uses tools to make it easier, so you don't have to be uh, a developer to do the testing if you. If you don't have those skills, then it's okay. You can get by without them. Um, and we called it the trusted tester program because the, the, basically that we don't have to go back and ask, uh, how did they get their answers on this, this test report? Um, and the trusted tester program is composed of three things. It's a, a test process, you know, here's a document that says, here's how to test for the standards. Um, and then there's training to teach people how to do the, the because if you just hand people a document, uh, experience has told us that doesn't work. 
Um, and then there's a certification exam, which is makes the the person actually test web pages and provide answer answers, and it gives them a score. And um, we set the bar pretty high of ninety percent pass because you want the testers to be giving you the accurate answers. And um, over time, we found that this has been very helpful. Um, let me go down the slide. Um, this is on slide slide 23. It's talking about where the training is. The training comes from the United States Department of Homeland Security, Office of Accessible Systems and Technology. And for anyone that wants to take it, it's free and to anyone. Um, let's go to slide 24. Um, we sort of hit on some of these, but it promotes a common interpretation of the standards, uh, helps people make decisions about accessibility faster, uh, helps you basically have apples to apples and oranges to oranges. If you're looking at, you know, you want to buy two things, you want to know which one's more accessible. Well, if you test them with the same process, you can get your answer and you can results. Uh, otherwise, who knows what you're going to get. Um, so I want to move on to slide five. Um, so I work for DQ Systems, and the motto of DQ Systems is accessibility for good. And um, when I left the government, um, after working on the, the tester process and training, um, I, I, I started work with DQ Systems, and we are picking up the ball and trusted tester and putting it into our products. Um, and our products are designed to help people at all stages of uh, design, development, test, maintain uh, accessible digital information. Um, and that's partial, that's what I'm with DQ for. They want me to help with that. Slide 26. Next um, placeholder rectangle DQ as we get released a new data on the popular next round. Slide 26. Um, uh, last week, DQ released a new product um, for anybody that does, is into the development or testing process, which brings together sort of all pieces of trusted tester into one product. So you have, a, and you have some automated testing, you have manual guided testing, and you have some training content in there to help you guide through what, and you can helps helps a developer learn how to do accessibility faster with less stress. Um, the the previously mentioned tester training it's it's probably two or three weeks to take that training overall, and most developers kind of laugh at you and say I don't want to do that, um, but they still need the work. And so, the product that was released called AX AXE is um, combines all those three things, and DQ is interested in people's feedback. Slide twenty seven questions. Slide view. Um, I had a couple other things that I, we didn't get into the slides. I think I hit on this um, about me. I'm just checking my my notes here. Oh, I did hit it all. Um, so I just want one last thing. Um, uh, well, two last things. So I've mentioned a couple things about accessibility standards. And again, the World Wide Web Consortium Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is really where I would, would point people to. Those are really the primary guidelines. Uh, uh, whoever's asking about the question for the link, can you, which link are you asking about? Um, Sean, Sean and I can make sure we get get the uh, the link that you need out to you. Um, so the CAG is the primary guideline. 
Um, W3.org is where they're sort of top level them, but if you do a Google search for WCAG, you'll find them maybe more than you wanted to know. Um, and beyond that, the thing that I try to try to tell people is that it re learn to have empathy for the the people who use your products or your web pages. Um, so learning to understand about different disabilities and how they use the web will give you a much better idea of what what your audience has to go through um, to use your your information or your um, your products. Um, understanding the accessibility guidelines and some of those the technology and technical solutions gives you the ability to uh, meet their needs. And then the last thing is if you are working in an environment where you're doing agile, so you know, in, instead of the old days where people would put requirements and, and then they would go in development and then they would go into test and it's all like six month segments and it might be two years from the beginning till anything comes out the end. Uh, today, everybody's doing agile developments and like, and some people are doing continuous development, continuous integration. Uh, where they release things every day, something little piece comes out. Uh, have that agility of doing things in short, small bursts gives you the ability to address accessibility every day or every two weeks and make people wait for six months to two years uh, for something to be fixed. And so I, I, I my little model of these days is empathy, understanding, and agility are the three things to, to get accessibility success. And um, with that, I'm gonna throw it out to questions. And, and John and I can certainly get any links that people are interested in out to you if we missed them. Hi, Alan, thank you for your presentation. And I I know that uh, you know you've shared a lot of valuable information. So I would invite everyone now to just ask your questions and mute your microphones and, and ask questions to Alan because Alan is like you know very very knowledgeable about testing and if you have questions or experiences about local websites, especially like for instance the banking system, um, you could perhaps make some suggestions or ask questions in terms of how we can go about. Uh, making those systems accessible. So I'll invite you just to meet your mics again and throw some questions out there. Hi, Alan. Yep. Yeah, this is Karen from Credit Alan Tobago. Um, wonderful presentation. I like the idea of the tool which you talked about to do the accessibility web the website testing for accessibility. See, um, normally when you, you hear me, right? Yep. Okay, no, normally I would, I would not, um, like use headings, navigation, navigation, et cetera, forms, edits, fields, et cetera, to check the accessibility. But, you know, thank you for the information. I'm learning. So, tool or test or, or, or exam that you go through, or it's a, what you get material and you study and you write an exam or how do you do how it how how, how it is done so the the tra training is a set of six online courses the first course goes over uh accessibility it's really almost like this uh it talks about what's what is accessibility and why it is important and it it talks about the standards and the assistive technologies the second course goes into very deeply into the accessibility guidelines so that you understand what each one of them is and the impact of the if you don't meet them in other words so if you don't have captions in a video well who does that impact it impacts people that can't hear it impacts people with limited hearing it can impact uh, you know people like captions they like to use captions on tvs when they're in a loud environment you know, they may be in a restaurant watching a football game and they want to hear the words, they can't. Um, so that's that course uh, goes through all the standards. 
Uh, and then you have a tool installation course to make sure you get your tools installed. Uh, there's a tool that Trusted Tester uses called Andy, A-N-D-I. Um, and it's a free tool uh, from uh, the Federal had, had developed that in conjunction with Trusted Tester. And then the big course, the big course is for Trusted Tester, which is like 22 modules. And really the process is that you have some reading material, then you have some multiple choice questions. Just really the intention is that you, did you understand what you read? And then you get some web pages that you have to test following the process that they gave you and um, get your, get your answers correct. So um, and it, you numerous times, but you'll get a different page each time. Okay. So that tool, the tool Andy, is is a hardware, right? Hardware. No, it's a um, it's a a favorite that can be loaded in your browser. Oh, okay. Um, like a plugin. Then. Um, yeah. Well, it, it's like a plugin, except it does security problems as plugins do. Right. So. Sounds interesting. Uh, and then if you want, if you get through the, the big course, there's an exam and a certification exam, uh, which put all those modules together and give you three web pages to test. Um, and if you pass all that, you're a certified tester. Wow, very, very interesting. So and, and there are people that reach out and say, hey, we'd like to get some trusted tester results. Um, uh, that there is work in that field. Mm -hmm. So, um... You said this can work on, as well as on apps as well on a yes um, yes it, it's a manual process so you can test it on websites you can test it on web apps and even even general apps right general apps on for example android or ios and cover mobile oh, uh yet okay. Okay. um that, that is in the works um you actually can do use andy on an iphone mm. um on Android, although I don't think we've tested it. Um, so if you have a web responsive app and you wanted to test it on the iPhone or on an iPad or something, um, you can. Tricky getting the, the bookmark would installed on there, but you can. Okay, so all right. Sounds real good. Um, Get an app success. And for anybody anybody interested in the accessibility field or career, I would tell you that it's a pretty interesting field um, and there's a lot of room for growth and employment in it. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and the, the, the attention to accessibility around the world is increasing. So they're gonna need more people to do work. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yep. Hi again. I guess I just want like clarity. Thanks for um, your presentation and like going through Trusted Tester. Um, you mentioned that DQ just launched um, a product. Um, could you talk a bit more about that? Uh, sure. So it's called AX. A X E. AX. Um, so DQ Systems has been in the accessibility business for about 20 years. Um, and I would, and I don't know the date that they did this, but in the accessibility business, the how do we do our testing was like the map that they sold for quite a while. And I've had, when I, as a federal government employee, I, I told them that you should be on how good of testing you do, not the magic. It's the it's the services you provide and the tools you provide. Um, and apparently somebody listened because DQ uh, made Axe open source uh, a few years ago. And it's a, actually it is a plugin for browsers. And it relies on a set of, it's a rule set of for example, if I have a picture and it doesn't have alternate text, then it will flag it. And there's a set of about 70 rules to let you do testing automatically. Um, 
to the extent possible. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So one of the requirements for accessibility, and this is always the easy one, but there's there's more difficult ones, is that you have to, if you have an image on a web page, um, a blind person, what that image is, uh, unless you provide all text that describes the, the image. Well, an automated tool can tell you if there's text, alternate text there for that image, but it won't tell you if it matches the image. They're not there yet. Um, so it can tell you if there's missing text, but it, it won't tell you if it's the correct text. Right. But it still can speed up that process greatly, and you can do a lot more of your time than you can do just alone manually. And the, the latest release, what it did was it, um, the tool now incorporated the automated tests. And so it, it will pop up, for example, and say, hey, I found um, I found this text that goes with this image. Does it match? Say, um, so it's got guided testing with the automated testing. And then in some cases, it's got some training material that it will pop up more about like, why did that fail or what is this how do i answer that question and so the the hope is that we can get developed doing more of that testing earlier in the process better instead of waiting you know, most of what happens is people wait and when you wait till the end nobody wants to hear that there's problems and you know there almost always are right uh, so the Sooner you can find problems and fix them, or everybody involved in the process is. And so that's what the newest release of Axe, um, it includes those those three components and DQ is really back from folks using it with the hope that it, it, it does a good job. Cool. Um, yeah, I, like my mind went on like a trajectory that was kind of like IG recently, um, because it's, you know, a place where people share photographs. Um, if anyone like that, like right before photograph loads, there's actually a bit of text and it kind of says something like, there's probably two people in this picture. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, really there yet to tell you Any when people put images in web pages, they usually had a, a intention for why they put them there. And so if you just say two people on a beach, um, usually that's not enough to tell you like, yeah, what am I supposed to know about those two people? Right. So, so that product is super useful. Yeah. So the, 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 the tool, I right, to correct this, uh, Axe will not correct it. It will just help you find things and tell you what you should do to correct it. Oh, oh, you need developers, you web developers. Oh, yes. Okay, 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 okay. So they want developers to use the tool, but other people can use yeah. it. Yeah. So, as like, well. if um, sorry, that example you just gave it, two people on the beach. You could, if a, a developer sees it, you could uh, adjust it to to be to give the exact. Um, that relates to the image. Yes, yes. The developer could just make an edit to their code and change the description and make it correct. Hmm. We need to have some websites and try that accessible, a little more accessible. <laughs> Somewhere. I really hope it helps. Stanley. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, there's an Aldo again. What I was gonna say is I'm probably gonna actually Can everyone hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Uh, hello? Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, we heard you, Stanley. Stanley, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, okay, I'm there. 
Yeah, I'm there. Um, I have a question. Um, as we are talking about digital accessibility, uh, how can we include everybody? As we know, everybody doesn't have the same ability, disability. Can can you you Hello? broke up you broke up a little bit in the middle of your question? Can you say that again, please? Okay, I said as we are talking about digital accessibility, how can we include everyone? As we know that everyone doesn't have the same disability. So. No perfect answer to that. Um, it's, you know, if you are creating something for an audience, um, putting out information that says, you know, we're looking for feedback, we're looking for people with disabilities and look for volunteers is one way to do it. Um, paying people to help you is another way to do it. That, that, that speeds them right up. They'll just come right on in the door. Oh, you're going to pay me. Um, for a variety of uh, per people with disabilities through those sort of means of offering, you know, you know paying people to participate in pilot tests, um, volunteers, making sure that, that people know that if they have a disability to please um, provide feedback. Um, as a person with a disability myself, uh, I always, some of the people, um, um, I've got another life. I have my own life. I don't want to fix your product. Just please get it done. Uh, so not everyone's going to want to participate. Um, you can hire people with disabilities to be in your development team. That's one of the best ways um, to make sure that you overlook issues. But again, you know, you not if you've got a two-person team, you're not going to represent every person with a disability out there. So that's where you want to work at getting uh, feedback from your, your customers, your audience. Uh, and there's no perfect mechanism for that. You can go to um, disability advocacy groups. Uh, I think my answer would be don't be afraid of asking. Um, some people are afraid that if they ask and it's not right, then people will all get angry at them. Um, people are more angry if, if you don't ask and you don't fix when they do ask then if you ask and you take their advice and try to do what you can, um, being a lot of, if as a person with a disability, if, if I'm using a product that may have some issues and I know they're working on it and I know they will fix it, it's just kind of how long is it going to take? I can be a lot more than if I don't think they're even working on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any more questions for Alan? Well, I want to thank everybody. Um, I uh, hope you learned something today. And I hope you continue through the rest of uh, the sessions. And um, if you have questions, uh, you, you guys can always come to me and DQ, and we'll do what we can to, uh, to help you out. Thank you, Alan. And thank you very much, Alan. Wonderful job, and I. I, I learned a lot tonight. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, thanks to Sean for the invite. Yes. So thank you, Alan. Thanks a lot for, for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. And um, I look forward to us uh, partnering on this again in maybe future presentations.